morning. I'm just trying to get everything set up on my computer. Um, no. Oh. oh my god, this is just not working. Go back. Do you guys hear like a buzzing sound in the back? I have my heater on and I want to make sure you guys can't hear it. But if you can, I'll just turn it off for the meantime. Okay. Um. All right. So I think I'm gonna start now. I can't find the cover to my Bible, but that's okay. Um. But yeah, we're gonna start. Let's get this to focus. Hopefully, this stays focused. I don't know. I see that Facebook did something different with their live on my phone. So hopefully autofocus is fixed. <laughs> but um, yeah, so today we're going to be diving into the book of Jonah. I do have my notes already here. I'm going to be focusing on chapter one. So I just took that out as well as the um, definitions worksheet that I created. I have my notepad with the definitions already written out so that this video is not too long. And it's okay, yeah, um, I was a little hot anyway, and then I have my iced coffee here, so I'll be fine until the end of this session, Tanya. But yes, um, we're going to be using, well, I'm going to be using my New King James translation. This is the, I don't know if you guys can see it, the NKJV Journal of the Word Bible from Thomas Nelson. I wanted to dive into using this in the videos just because this is the translation I personally use and though I do enjoy the ESB, I just really wanted to start using <laughs> this Bible um, for the Bible studies. I'll go back into using the ESV and probably will even use the CSB in other videos but um, for now on I just wanted to stick to this one. But um, for those who are new to watching these live sessions or who are new on the YouTube channel, I'm going to just run through the materials I'm using. So besides from the Bible, I'm going to be using my Micron Pigma Archival Ink Pen. This one is in the 01, which is a 0.25 millimeter. I don't know. I just, I like these pens. I just don't care for the nibs. Like they're a little bit squared. So I don't know. Um, then I have the Crayola Super Tips. The markers to highlight with the Crayola Susbu colored pencils to highlight with my zebra mild liners and then the Sharpie smear guard highlighters. Um, you can use any of the Sharpie highlighters, I believe. Probably, I'm not sure about the accent one. Somebody asked me about that. I'm not sure how well those do, but I know that these um, I get these from Rite Aid for like less than three dollars. They come in a pack of five and they don't have the clip But um, they don't bother me and they don't bleed through in my books or my Bibles. So Yeah, I'm gonna do a very quick prayer <laughs> um, You guys know I'm working on praying better. I'm working on it. Still get nervous when I have to pray out loud So um, I'm just gonna do a quick prayer Let me sip this Alrighty Heavenly Father, we thank you for waking us up this morning. We thank you for giving us working limbs and organs, Father God. I ask that you come into this study that we, that we may be able to take something from this study and apply it to our lives. That we may be able to learn something from Jonah that we can relate to and also be able just to change our lives. Amen. So yeah, <laughs> I'm working on prayer, so bear with me as I get into that. But yeah, um, I titled this one Jonah's, um, not Jonah's, I titled this one Deliberate Disobedience because this first chapter is all about him deliberately disobeying God's word. 
and chapter one is only 17 verses yeah these are going to be like probably short studies because the verses are pretty short which i'm all for um so yeah so for those who don't know my method um i do bible journaling and when people hear bible journaling they think of art bible journaling i don't do the artistic stuff i tried it before and i felt convicted so the way i do it is more so of using my bible as an actual journal um so you can write down your prayers your thoughts and things like that so what i do is i read paragraph by paragraph or chapter by chapter um for the sake of this study i'm gonna go section by section so we're gonna just start off with this first section which i think is three verses we're gonna read that through the first time just completely through just to understand the context and everything then we will go through and circle words that we want to define. After we do that, we will go through a second time in the read. And as we're reading the second time through, we will underline parts of the verses or phrases that stick out to us. And then from then on, we will write our notes and add color. I just think that it makes, you know, studying the word even more fun. Um, I can show you guys here. This is in Psalms. I'm still studying the book of Psalms. I have not gotten past it yet. But um, this is pretty much it. I don't know. It just does something to the eyes and makes me want to study the word. So, yeah. Yes, Kimberly. Um, the, the study videos are always they always stay up on Facebook. And then I also end up uploading them onto YouTube the following week. Um, hopefully I can have this video uploaded by Friday to YouTube. So you can definitely always um, rewatch the studies whenever you want. It doesn't matter. You can study it once, twice, three times, however you feel. So they're always up here in the Facebook group and on YouTube. But um, let's just jump in. So it says, now the word came, I'm sorry, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amatai, I think that's how you say that, saying, arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Teresh. Tarash, I think that's how you say that, from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found the ship going to Teresh. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Teresh from the presence of the Lord. You're welcome, Kimberly. So the first thing I'm going to do is circle words that I want to define. So the first one is going to be Jonah. Um, his father's name, which I believe is Amatai. Then we have Arise, Nineveh, and then we have Flee. I don't know if it's Tarshish or Teresh. I always say Teresh, but I feel like it's Tarshish. Um, Jopa is the next one. And I think those are the only ones that I want to define. So um, I like to define names because when you look up like their Hebrew or Greek meaning to the different names, it kind of relates to their character. And I feel like that's the case with Jonah. Um, so here's the paper that's in the actual packet if you have it. So Jonah in Hebrew, this is the word. And the words, the definitions will be in Hebrew because the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The definition for that is dove or pigeon, and I personally think that's interesting because we know that birds tend to fly a lot. Um, they love flying away from things, especially when they're scared or terrified. So I just think that it's quite interesting that Jonah's name is dove or pigeon and that he was very quick to flee from God. I just thought that was interesting. Um, so Amatai means firmness, faithfulness, or truth. Arise means to start, make a move, to go somewhere. Nineveh is just the capital of Assyria. Flee, here is the Greek word, I mean Greek, <laughs> here's the Hebrew word, and it just means to make haste or run away. Tarshish, I'm going to say Tarshish, um, is a port on the Mediterranean, and then Joppa is a seaport city of Palestine. So I'm just now going, I have, like I said, already written down, so I'm just going to add color. So Jonah, well, that doesn't look right.
And I'm just taking at the Crayola Super Tips right now. I really like these. I have like a 50 pack. I want to get another pack so that I can give it away in a giveaway. Um, I'm going to be working on some giveaways on my Facebook page soon. So I'm just trying to get all of that stuff together. But And I correlate the color that I circle with to the actual color that I'm boxing with so that I know which goes with which. I hope you guys cannot hear that. Somebody's car alarm is going off. All right. Now that that's out of the way. Oops. Don't want to lose that. We're going to now go back in and start underlining parts of the verses that stand out. Um, and keep in mind, again... Um, for those of you who are new to these studies, I study obviously on my own, but I always would like you guys to either study it, um, prior to these kind of live sessions or even after that way you are able to pick up your own kind of notes and thoughts on the text. Um, never just take my word as it is because it's just not the way you should do things. You should definitely st be able to study it for yourself. So hopefully that makes sense. But, um. So it says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. So this is now telling us that God spoke to Jonah in his own way. Because it's telling us now that the word came to Jonah and it was of the Lord. Going on to verse 2, it says, arise. So that's telling me that God wanted Jonah to get up from wherever he was and to make a move. So I'm actually going to underline this. And up here. I'm just going to say God wanted Jonah to get up and make a move. So no one knows exactly where Jonah is, but this is important because it's telling me that not only did God come to speak to him directly, but now he's giving him a directive to actually get up and to do something. And um, I don't know. I just thought that was interesting. So now I'm just going to make an arrow. Awesome, Stacy. I'm reading the comments on my laptop, so if it takes me a minute to respond to you guys' comments, it's because I have my laptop to decide so that I can focus, um, make sure that my phone is focused on the actual Bible. Um, then it says, go to Nineveh. So, Jonah was basically to go to Nineveh, which is the capital of Assyria, which was a wicked place. This was um, a pagan Gentile city that was not of God's people. And we can see that God was sending him out to save those not within the covenant. So even before Jesus came, God was about saving the entire world. He wasn't just about trying to save his people, but he definitely wanted to um, be able to save those who were not in the covenant, who were not his chosen people. And for this, he was sending his prophet Jonah to do this work. So... I'm going to underline, go to Nineveh. And so how do I want to write this? God was sending him out. To save those of a pagan Gentile city. So God cares for all people. And though he focused on um, his chosen, he still cared for those who were not his chosen. Then it says, cry out against it. So basically, rebuke them for their sins and call them to repentance.
Then it says, their wickedness has come up before me. Their wickedness has come up before me. This pen here. Okay. So basically, God sees all and must um, have... I'm sorry, I was just rereading the note. So God sees all and must have come to a point of judgment, um, but he wanted to give them warning to give them a choice. So he was concerned about Nineveh and its people. He didn't want to just um, condemn them in a sense, if that makes sense. He really wanted to give them an opportunity to be able to turn from their sins because, because they were not God's chosen. They didn't really know the law. They didn't really know right from wrong. So now he is trying to give them that opportunity to see their wrongs and to give them the opportunity to change. That's pretty much how God did it with um, the chosen. They didn't know anything, so that's why the law was created. The law was created to now, um, in a sense, expose the sins of the people. And now that your sins are exposed, it's kind of like you now have the option to whether you want to um, correct your way of life or if you want to continue down that way of sin. So I'm going to say... God wanted to give them warning and a chance to let them repent. And change and I don't have another Bible in front of me so I'm just gonna grab my note because I have some cross references I'm not gonna read all the cross references but I will read a few of them so just bear with me one second so I can find this cross reference This iced coffee I made is so delicious. So random, but I just had to say that. Okay, this is not working. I do not have the time for that to... So I'm just grabbing a different Bible so that I can look up this scripture. Alright, so... Okay, so the cross-reference is going to be Hosea 7 and 2. And um, I'm re this is in the King James translation because I couldn't find my other Bibles. But it says, And they consider not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their own doings have beset them about. They are before my face. So this part really reminds me of when he said, For their wickedness has come before me. And then the other one. I'm not even going to do because that one is too long. <laughs> so we're just going to say Hosea 7 and 2. If you do have the printable, then you do have the other cross-reference. But um, I'm just going to do that one for now. Verse 3, then it says, uh, Jonah arose to flee to Tarash, Tarshish sorry, from the presence of the Lord. So Jonah arose to flee Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So now Jonah willingly ran away from God for his own beliefs of Nineveh not being deserving to escape God's judgment. He sought to run away from the call God had for him to do. So because he felt like Nineveh was a place of wickedness, he felt personally that they did not deserve to um, be forgiven. He felt like they did not deserve to escape the wrath of God. He felt like God should have just punished them, but that was not something he should have done on his own. Um, that's kind of him being prideful and him also being judgmental of a people. And then this also reminds me or tells me that um, we can never really run from God's presence, no matter what we try to do. Jonah really tried hard to run from his presence, like really hard. Um, but there's a cross reference for that in Psalms 139. And 
I'm just going to read it out of this Bible because, yep, I'm just looking for the cross reference. Okay, so before I read the cross reference, no problem, Kimberly, it's okay. Um, the printables are on my blog. It's daughterofincrease.blogspot.com. Um, and then there's a section that says shop. I'll actually um, put the link now. And you just purchase the um, printables for $10. And I think this one is about 30 pages as well. So it's like 30 pages full of notes for the complete book that we're studying. So give me one second. And I'll post it for you. Hopefully that went through. I think I posted it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you go on the blog, it's um, actually 22 pages full of notes um, with chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4, plus some extra things as far as the definitions and different charts. You're welcome. But um, yeah, so I'm going to quickly write that. Jonah willingly ran away from God out of Okay. So Jonah willingly ran away, which is crazy because um, as a prophet, he should have been able to do the work that God called him to do. But instead, he decided to let his own judgments and his own pride kind of block his call. Um, and he thought that he could just easily run away. But we understand that we can never run away from his presence. God is um, everywhere. There's nowhere to run. So if you read Psalms 139 verses 7 through 10, it says, um, I don't like reading it in the King James. Oh, my God. Let me open this in the New King James. I'm sorry, guys. I just I don't like the way the King James is written. I can read the King James, but I just don't like the tither and wither and thou and all of that. I just I don't like it. So. 7 through 10. So Psalms 139 verses 7 through 10 says, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the out uttermost parts of the sea even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me so god is everywhere you go um he will never leave you nor forsake you so there's really nowhere that you can run from him you may think you're running from him um but it's just not possible to run from him he is everywhere <laughs> you go so i am just going to add color now And I dropped the pencil. That's okay. I don't know why I get silent when I start like adding color. I just do. <laughs> but I know when like when I edit the videos, I always edit this part out because I think I'm just too silent. I feel like I got to focus. <laughs> focus when I'm doing this. And I guess I can go with red for this part. Alrighty. Hmm. 
Moving on now. I'm going to read from verse 4 through 9. And this is about the storm at sea. Oh, wait. No, I'm not done. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so going back to verse 3. It says, found a ship going to Tarshish. Hope you guys can see that. Found a ship going to Tarshish. Um, so nothing happens by chance with God. For him to have found, apparently, a ship means that God had to have known he would have chosen to flee instead of following his instructions. This also could have been the leading of the enemy. Um, either way, this was done on impulse. So an impulse may be very brave, yet wrong. Jonah was very brave. Um in embarking on such a long sea journey an impulse may appear to be self-denying yet wrong it cost jonah much money and comfort to go on this long sea journey an impulse may lay claim to freedom yet be wrong jonah um basically jonah was free to go to tarshish um and then an impulse may lead someone to do something that would condemn I'm sorry, guys. I'm reading this totally wrong. An impulse may lead someone to do something that they would condemn in others. So what would Jonah say to another prophet disobeying God? Hopefully that made sense. If it didn't, let me know. <laughs> and I'll repeat all of that. Um, and then an impulse can make us do to God or others what we would never want to be done to ourselves. And I think that was key. Um, he willingly tried to uh leave the presence of god but i don't think he would personally want god to willingly leave him so an impulse is something that makes us do something quickly really without thinking hi miriam hopefully that made sense <laughs> so um found a ship going to tarshish um nothing happens by chance So I'll just reread all that again because I felt like I read it all wrong. <laughs> so it says, found a ship going to Tarshish. Um, nothing happens by chance with God for him to have found him being Jonah. So for Jonah to have found a ship going to Tarshish meant that God um, already knew that he would choose to flee instead of following his instructions. This also could have been the leading of the enemy. Um, either way, this was done on impulse. So Jonah finding a ship was on impulse. Him wanting to flee was on impulse. So an impulse can be brave at some times, but it's still wrong. Jonah was brave in embarking on such a long sea journey. An impulse may appear to be self-denying, but it's still wrong because it cost Jonah much money and comfort to go on this long journey. The long journey meaning um, the part that we're getting ready to read <laughs> um, as far as him being at sea. Um, an impulse may lay claim to freedom, but um, the question is, are you really free? An impulse may lead someone to do something that they would condemn in others. So would Jonah say to what would Jonah say to another prophet disobeying God? And then an impulse can make us do to God and others what we would never want to be done to ourselves. And now the last part in verse three is um, so he paid the fare. Okay, so Jonah was determined um, to leave God's presence and not follow his instructions. He even went as far as paying his way to leave the presence of an omnipresent God. So when you run away from the Lord, you never get to where you are going. You always pay your own fare, if that makes sense. Um, when you go the Lord's way, you not only get to where you're going, but you don't have to pay the fare. So what I mean by that is as we're getting ready to read in verses four through nine, um, actually the rest of chapter one. Um, if Jonah would have just gotten up and did as God said and went to Nineveh, he would not have had to come out of pocket. Most likely, um, God would have provided a way for him to make that travel, but because he decided on his own and willingly to disobey God and to try and escape the presence of God, he now had to pay his way on his own and he never even got to where he wanted to go. 
because obviously as we're getting ready to read there were some situations that happened that god prevented him from getting to where he personally wanted to go hope that's making sense <laughs> but um yeah so for this i am going to write where do i want to put that i'm going to write so determined He paid his own way. Instead of trusting God. And sometimes that's how it is. Um, especially when it comes to like work and things like that. Many people will choose to um, financially try to figure things out on their own. Instead of um, trusting God to work it out. And though finances is, is, has nothing to do <laughs> with Jonah. I just, I don't know, that just came to my mind. So instead of trusting God. Okay, now I'm ready to move on. <laughs> so now we're going to read the storm at sea, which is verses 4 through 9. So it says, But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. When the mariners were afraid, they... I'm sorry. When the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God, and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down to the lowest part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. Verse 6, so the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. <clears throat> Sorry, verse 7, and they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Please tell us for whose, for whose cause is this trouble upon us. What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and what of and of what people are you? So he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. So, yeah, I think many of us are um, can relate of, of trying to do things. I know for me personally, that's how I've been for the past couple of years, um, especially with having a son. I try so hard to figure things out on my own when God is just like, trust me, let me do it. And um, I don't necessarily flee from him like Jonah did, but I kind of um, kind of pull myself away from him in a sense so that I can try to figure things out on my own. And when I do that, I end up having to come out of pocket financially. I'm emotionally drained. I am mentally drained or anything like that. And um, I find that it's much easier when you just stay aligned with him when you stay in his will and when you just follow his plan because then you're not really tiring yourself out you're not um draining yourself emotionally physically or financially so i think that's just for everybody um how we all are it's just a matter of recognizing it and um trying to better yourself about being that way if that makes sense <laughs> and i know i keep saying if that makes sense because a lot of the times when i'm typing out these notes or like thinking in my mind it makes sense to me until i start saying it out loud and then i'm just like what so i know i say it often and many people tell me don't worry about it but it's just a habit so yeah let me just fix this f okay um so we are going to now circle some words Right. Yes, we're going to circle some words. And I only have two, if I'm not mistaken, just two. Um, the first being Tempest, which is in verse four. And Lots, which is, uh, where is it's somewhere down here. <laughs> Lots is in verse seven. Here it is.
So, Tempest, this is the Hebrew word, and it just means hurricane, stormy, or whirlwind. And Lot, Hebrew word, and it just means portion for dividing or assigning. I'll leave it there so you guys can see that. And now I'm just going to add some color. Okay. Now, moving on to underlining. So it said, the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea. So this tells me that not only can God calm a storm, but he can also stir it up to get your attention. Jonah's deliberate disobedience was not acceptable to God, and he felt safe as he fled from God's call. So God decided to intervene in a supernatural way. And um, the cross-reference I have for that is going to be Psalms 107. And verse 25, so Psalms 107 and verse 25 says, He commands and he raises a stormy wind, which lifts up the waves of the sea. So, not only can God calm a storm, he can also stir it up to get your attention and um, cross reference for that again is Psalms 107 25 then it says so that the ship was about to be broken up So Jonah's decision to willingly disobey was now endangering those around him. When you go where you have no place being, you cause others unneeded trouble. So um, I know for, I, I, have I ever been in a situation like that? I'm not sure if I've ever been that disobedient to God where I have caused other people um trouble but i'm pretty sure some of you may be able to think of a time where you went somewhere that you wasn't supposed to be and um it kind of caused something to happen to those around you so this just reminds me that we need to be mindful of the things that god tells us to do and how we um need to just be obedient because when we disobey your disobedience doesn't just affect you it affects everyone around you so if god is now telling him to go to nineveh but he's like no i'm not going to go to nineveh i'm going to pay my own way i'm going to find me a ship and i'm going to go to tarshish and i'm going to get on this ship with these people and these people don't even know what's going on as we read they're they're praying to their gods trying to figure out why you know the the sea is picking up while they're in a storm, they have no idea of what's going on. But Jonah knows. He knows what's going on, and he's just like, it, it doesn't bother him. And we'll read further. Like, he goes down, and he goes to sleep, which makes no sense. But I'll get to that verse. But, um, yeah, when, when, when you go um, places that you have no place being, and when you're disobeying willingly, you're now not just causing yourself trouble but you're endangering the lives of other people you're causing them trouble be it on a physical level emotional level mental level or a spiritual level good morning angela um you're now affecting other people because of your disobedience and this also just reminds me of the whole idea of sin um when you sin your sin doesn't just um affect you some sins are general um they have like how how, how can i say it your gen your your sins pretty much um go down the line to other generations within your lineage if that makes sense um it happened a lot with like Saul and David and them 
their sins were passed on to um, their children and then the consequences of their sins were passed on down to their children. So it's just like the things that you do, your disobedience, your sinfulness, your sinful ways, your wickedness, it doesn't just affect you. It affects those around you, be it in the future, the present, or whatever the case, if that makes sense. <laughs> Again, there I go with that, if that makes sense, of course. But um, I'm going to actually write that on here because I'm running out of space. So, verse 4. I'm, I don't know why I'm writing with this. I need to write with a regular pen. So, yeah. Let me just trace that over. Verse 4. Um, Jonah's. I'm probably spelling this all wrong, but who cares? Willingness to disobey. Endangered. Those around him. When you go where you have no place. being you cause others unneeded trouble so these mariners were probably just doing their job doing what they normally do and now they got this prophet who willingly disobeyed god Sorry, my mom is calling the house phone. Have my brother picked it up. Have my brother pick up the phone. But um, so yeah, these marinas are on their, you know, they're just doing their job on these ships. They now have this prophet who willingly disobeys God, get on their ship, and now they're stuck in the middle of a storm that has nothing to do with them. Um, and it also just reminds me that we need to be mindful of those people we choose to be around. Um, because sometimes we find ourselves in situations that have nothing to do with us. It really much so has um, something to do with the other people, but because we are, um, entwined in their lives, we are now caught up in their storms and their problems. So it's just be mindful of, um, how you're disobeying the things that you're doing and about the people around you and whether they're disobeying God, because, um, you don't want to be caught up in someone else's storm. And you also don't want to cause unneeded trouble or endanger the lives of other people because of your own personal disobedience so i don't know i'm i like jonah when i studied it it was just a lot like jonah was it was speaking to me quite much quite much is not a proper sentence but yep and let's do pink Okay, so then verse 5 says, every man cried out to his God. So the men tried to fix the problem the only way their minds knew how, and that's crying out to their gods and throwing out cargo. But only one God could fix the problems. Um, only one God can fix the problems we have. It doesn't matter if you cry out to your mama, your best friend, your cousin, your child. Um, it really doesn't matter who you cry out to, but they cannot fix your problem. The only fixer is God. So then it says that Jonah had gone down into the lowest part of the ship. That's here. Um, but Jonah had gone down into the lowest part of the ship. So the men tried to fix their problem by getting rid of things on the surface and not from within. But sometimes you need to go to the lowest parts and depths to clear it out of things. Um, I'm sorry, clear it out for things to change. And um, I don't know why that stuck out to me when I was studying it, um, you know, these men were on the surface throwing things out. And that's what we tend to do a lot personally in our lives. We just look at um, the surface level of things when a lot of the times the problem is at the lowest parts. It's in the depths and the crevices of our hearts. So on this ship, these men are on top throwing out things that's on the surface, the cargo. I'm pretty sure they have food and, you know, other things. But, um, 
their real problem that they really needed to get rid of was now going to the lowest parts of the ship to be. It, I'm hoping I'm, I hope I'm making sense. <laughs> but um, Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship. Sometimes... You need to go to the lowest parts to clear it out and not just the surface. put my coffee over there because it's shaking so yeah um jonah had gone down to the lowest parts of the ship and then it says laying down and was fast asleep so now not only did jonah willingly disobey god not only did he now have to pay his own weight because he decided to um disobey god not only did he want to try to escape the presence of an omnipresent god um not only did he cause a storm that now endangered the lives of other people but now he even decides I'm gonna fall asleep so he slept in the midst of the storm that he was the cause of so knowing that he could have probably done something he allowed his resistance and rebellion to keep him away from God Jonah is like a careless Christian that is asleep in their walk and that is the most dangerous type of Christian is a Christian that is asleep in their walk um, so he's hiding out. He's staying away from the work of God. He's not praying because he probably should have been praying to God. Um, he's probably aware of what's going on around him, but not fully aware, if that makes sense. It's kind of like when you're aware of something, but you don't really know all the details of it. So, um, he has no idea of the, the how serious the problem is around him. He's now a danger to himself and others. Um, and, you know... You can definitely walk, talk, cry, and laugh and think in your sleep, but it's not going to be effective as if you were doing all that when you're awake. So, laying down and was fast asleep. Um, I'll write this over here. I'm going to be late to class today, but that's all right. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to write that he slept amid the storm, that he was the cause of like a Christian asleep in their walk good morning Tanya Okay, moving on to verse 6, um, it says, where is it? Arise, call on your God, perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. So, these men knew that their gods weren't going to help them, so they inquired about Jonah's God to help them. They demanded that he call God, but um, he was trying to escape God, so... For that, I have Psalms 107 and 28. Right? Yeah. 
as a, as a cross reference. Well, let me underline this first. Arise, call on your God, perhaps your God will consider us. That's the only part I'm going to underline. Um, they knew only his God could save them. And, um, you know, it comes to a point in time when you cry out for help, when you try to seek advice from other people that you come to a point where you're where you understand that no one can do anything for you but God and that's pretty much where these um <clears throat> mariners came to they prayed to their gods got no answer they threw out cargo um still nothing happened so now they finally understand that okay there's one person on this ship who hasn't prayed to their god and maybe their god is the only god that can help us so now this captain goes down and he's waking up this sleeping christian this i'm, I'm calling him a christian but the sleeping prophet who well, one should not be asleep you're a prophet you should be able to um pray to god be in his presence speak to him especially when there's a storm happening around you that you caused and are now endangering the lives of people. So Jonah is really just doing, a, he, he's a hot mess at this point in time. Um, he's not really acting the way a prophet should act. Yeah, I'm definitely going to be late. But that's okay. <laughs> um, then in verse 7, it says, Let us cast lots that we may know whose trouble this... <coughs> I don't know why my throat just got dry. Um, whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So the men understood that, there was no, that this was no normal storm. They understood that it was a spiritual one. And um, that it could have been done purposely or as a superstition. But either way... They took it by um, casting lots to figure out who caused this. So casting lots was a common form of divination to discern the Lord's guidance in various ways. And um, you can read about that in Leviticus 16 and 8, as well as Judges 20 verses 9 through 10. <coughs> oh my gosh. Sorry guys, hold on. Oh. But um, you can literally just look up lots in your Bible if you have a concordance at the back of your Bible. And there's going to be so many verses on it. But um, it was a way of <coughs> discerning the Lord's guidance in various ways. So because they prayed to their gods, because they threw out, um, threw, like, threw overboard a bunch of cargo... Because they were now understanding that this was not a normal storm, but a spiritual one. Oh my gosh. <coughs> I'm sorry, guys. I don't know what is going on with my throat. It's like re getting really dry. Okay. <laughs> um, They decided to do something which was called casting lots to figure it out. And if you guys remember, this is something that they did when it came to um, the crucifixion of Christ. They cast lots for his clothing. So that's basically what happened. And then it said the lot fell on Jonah. So in Jonah going on the ship to run, this is kind of like God calling him out. So the lot fell on Jonah. I really feel like this was God calling him out on his on his um hot mess honestly because you know once i found out what um casting lots was and it says that it's discerning the lord's guidance in various ways this is now telling me that um you know god was like all right you trying to run for me now i'm gonna call you out because you're not um coming to what what is the word that i want to say um he's not living up to the standard if you will of what a prophet should be doing Okay, sorry you guys if you hear that. My mom just came back in the house. <laughs> so, sorry. But, um, God called Jonah out. Mm. 
Okay. So that the lot fell on him. Now we understand that nothing is done by accident. Um, nothing is a coincidence. There's nothing that happens by chance. Everything is already known by God. So <clears throat> the lot falling on Jonah was not a coincidence. This was literally God calling him out on the hot mess that he was and the things that he was doing. Moving on to verse 8. It says, um, what is your occupation? And of all the questions that you could ask, for them to ask this man, what is your occupation? Um, there must have been something about Jonah that made him stand out for them to ask what he does. Um, we know that he tried running from his call, but once again, this is God calling him out. Um, God calls you there. I'm sorry, hold on. Oh, okay. <laughs> I had to reread my notes. But um, basically, you know, Jonah tried running, but once God calls you to do something, there is a different aura around you. You cannot change the aura. You cannot change the call. You cannot change the glow. You cannot change the radiance, whatever you want to call it. When God calls you to do something, whether it's to prophesy, to teach, um, to minister to someone, to help someone, like it doesn't matter. When he calls you to do something, something about your aura changes and you can't unchange that difference that he created from calling you to do something if that makes sense um you know so the fact that they really asked what is your occupation it just out of all the questions they really could have asked like i was fine with them saying um you know whose cause is this trouble upon us i was fine with them asking where he came from what country you know who his people are that's all common sense you know you want to figure out who the who this person is that's causing you trouble but to ask what is your occupation I don't think I would ask that kind of question, <laughs> honestly, when I'm in the middle of a, a like a storm, be it, you know, spiritual, physical, whatever. I wouldn't ask that kind of question. Um, I would really just try to figure out what's going on. But they really ask that question. I feel like that was another way of God trying to get his attention. God called him to do something. And because he was called to do something, his aura was changed. And with that change, um, it's noticeable to people. So no matter how hard you try to run from God's presence, you can't. He's omnipresent. No matter how hard you try to run from the call, you can't because once he calls you, you now have a different aura. You now have a different spirit about you. So, um, once God calls you, your aura changes. Then in verse 9, he says, I am Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven. So Jonah knows the truth about God. He feared him, yet was running from him. Jonah's life contradicted his knowledge of God. And even a believer who was in a state of rebellion can give glory to God if he only will tell the truth about God. <coughs> and there goes my throat again. Oh, my gosh. I'm sorry, guys. Bear with me for a second. This is ridiculous. Um, so I fear the Lord, the God of heaven. So again, um, Jonah knew the truth about God. He feared him yet was running away from him. His entire life simply contradicted the knowledge of God. Um, and a believe, even a believer who was in a state of rebellion can give glory to God if he will only tell the truth about God. So the question here is, do your actions and the way that you carry yourself show that you fear God? Because a lot of the times we say we trust him, but our actions don't show that we trust him. A lot of the times we say that we reverence him, but our actions don't show that we reverence him. So the question here is, do your actions and the way that you carry yourself show that you fear God? And here's another error. <laughs> so, um... Do your actions and the way you carry self show that you fear 
God. Because for Jonah, um, the way that he carried himself didn't show that he truly feared God. He ran away from God. Um, he disobeyed God. He slept in the middle of a storm that he could have fixed. He put other people in harm's way because of his disobedience. And he didn't live according to um, the word of God. Obviously, the word being the word that came to him from God at the beginning in um, verse 1. So... That's just a important question that I feel like we all need to ask ourselves. I know for me, I say that I trust God, but then a lot of the times I don't act as if I trust him because I try to do things on my own. I say that I reverence him, but sometimes there are things that I say and do that don't show reverence to God. So this question is more of like a heart check question. It really makes you um, just ponder how you are. In regards to the way you act and what you say you believe. All right. <clears throat> and the last paragraph. This part is now Jonah is thrown into the sea and also Jonah's prayer and deliverance. So, verse 10. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more temp temptuous. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to return to land, but they could not. For the sea continued to grow more temp temptuous against them. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, we pray, O Lord, be please do not let us perish for this man's life. And do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done everything. As it please you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. And then I'm going to continue verse 17. Um, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So um, I only have one word, and that is in verse 17, and that is the word prepared. And um, prepared is here. Here is a Hebrew word, and it just means, um, sorry, that's past. <laughs> prepared, the Greek, I'm saying Greek, oh gosh, the Hebrew word. <laughs> and then to assign or appoint is the definition. Okay. So then it says, why have you done this right here? Why have you done this? So even an unbeliever who knows some truth about God can rightly rebuke a Christian who is resisting God. The storm is a reminder of God's presence. So um, have you ever, <laughs> I'm laughing because like I've been put in a situation like this before where you being a believer know the word of God, but you kind of disobey the word of God. And then you come like you hang out with people that don't know the word of God. But they kind of rebuke you for doing things that are wrong as a Christian. Have you ever been put in that kind of situation? Because I know I have. And um, when you're put in that kind of situation, it kind of, one, it makes you almost kind of get prideful in a sense. Because I know for me, when somebody would try to tell me something about the word of God um, and how I wasn't doing, you know, something according to the word of God. And I'm just like, you don't even know the word of God. You don't know the Bible. You ain't say like I would get real defensive. But at the end of the day, um, God can use anybody to rebuke you, to get you to understand you're wrong, and to get you on track of what you're supposed to be doing. And um, the whole idea of the storm being God's presence is true because obviously He's omnipresent. Um, God is all powerful. He's sovereign over everything. He created the heavens and the earth. Um, so He has power 
to stir up the sea and the wind. He has power to create a storm, and that storm is letting you know not only is he not happy with you for you disobeying him, but it's also letting you know that he is there at that point in time, so that he is there, um, he is present around you even when you try to get away from him. So, why have you done this? I'm going to say... An unbeliever can rightly rebuke a Christian resisting God. Now, even though a unbeliever can do that, there's also you understanding and wisdom <laughs> when an unbeliever is rightfully rebuking you versus when they just want to cause problems okay so that's another thing to keep in mind not every unbeliever is going to rebuke you rightly so Um, verse 11, it says, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? So they sought to find a way to fix their current situation. Um, they just wanted out. They didn't want to be a part of this, uh, s this spiritual kind of, um, storm that had nothing to do with them. They wanted a way out out when people are involved in something that has nothing to do with them whether you are the cause or you're involved in someone else's drama you will always try to find a way out so that's basically what these marinas were trying to do i mean in verse 12 it says pick me up and throw me into the sea so pick me up and throw me into the sea so jonah knew something had to be done he knew staying on board was now going to endanger those around him Personally, he should have knew that from the start <laughs> back in verse four when he's when he realized that um, they were in a storm and that the ship was about to be broken up instead of going down into the deepest parts, lowest parts of the ship. He should have done something, at least prayed to God or something. But instead, he decided to sleep. So not only did you not pray, not only did you not help, but you went to the deepest parts of the ship. Then you fell asleep on the job. You already disobeyed him. You tried to run away from him. You are prideful because you felt like Nineveh didn't deserve a second chance and you were judgmental. So there's so many things piling up that it comes to a point where sometimes God has to make you get thrown overboard. And, you know, it's it's not a comfortable feeling to be thrown overboard. I've thankfully never been thrown overboard physically. But when you watch movies and stuff, you see these people like um, in these like uh what, what are these uh oh my gosh when they're in the movies and there's like a storm at sea and they get tossed overboard whether it's by a person or because the boat is like shaking so much when they get tossed overboard these people are drowning right so um you know you never want to be put in a situation where god has to do something to pretty much get your attention that bad if that makes sense so um, pick me up, throw me into the sea. He knew something had to be done. Staying would continue. to harm others. And for those of you who are new um, to watching these videos, when I write my notes, my notes tend to look like chicken scratch. <laughs> so um, pay those no mind. I'm just looking for this cross-reference quickly. So for this, I'm going to say John 11 and 50, I think it is. Yeah, John 11 50 is a cross-reference. Um, 
In John 11 and 50 says, Nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not the whole nation should perish. So in this instance, that was obviously referring to Jesus <laughs> um, in John 11. But when you're comparing it to Jonah's kind of situation, it's better for him to be thrown overboard instead of everyone on the ship who was innocent to die for his mistake. So... There's a lot of things that you can see um, in correlation to Jonah and Jesus. And I think I included that in the study guide notes. So, yeah. Um, moving on. Well, he says, for I know that this great tempest um, is because of me. So, you know, he understood that this storm was because of his disobedience to God and this was kind of his admission of guilt and throughout the whole chapter so far he did not admit to his you know stupidity I'm gonna say um he just rode the wave he just let things happen as is but um now he's seeing how dangerous it's getting he is now admitting to the um I guess his guilt in disobeying God so, verse 13, it says, Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land. So, the men tried to do the right thing and not throw a prophet overboard. They feared the Lord. So, they knew that if they threw this, this prophet, that God would probably do something to them because they threw a prophet overboard. And um, they wanted to be respectful. So, these men had a respect for God, even though they didn't really know God. Um, so, nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land. They did not. want to throw a prophet overboard i mean i don't think anyone would want to incur the wrath of god by doing it back in that time especially because god was very protective of his prophets and judges and things like that so um you know they feared him but not more not so in like a reverential type of fear but they like was like afraid of this man like they was afraid of god like they didn't know what he could have did to them if he would have um if they would have thrown this prophet overboard so they tried to um you know tried to take him to land okay so these people had a heart they might not have known god but they had a heart um but then it says but they could not so no matter your heart's intentions um God will keep the storm brewing unless you are removed from where you don't belong. So, no matter how much they wanted to um, honor this prophet, no matter how kind they felt and compassionate they felt in their heart um, about not throwing him overboard, God was not happening. He was like, no, you need to throw him overboard because he needs to be removed immediately. Because rowing takes time to get to where you need to go. Sometimes God don't want you to take your time to get out of a situation or a place that you don't need to belong, need to belong, um, where you don't belong. He wants you out of that situation immediately and he will find a way to get you out of that situation immediately. And in this case for Jonah, it was being thrown overboard. So they could not. Sometimes God wants immediate removal. You know, so he don't want you to take your sweet time to get out of the situation. He wants you to immediately get out of that situation and move on with your life. Not be sitting, um, waiting to get to a safer def destination. Sometimes he will smack you upside your head. <laughs> and it, I mean, that's pretty much how he did it with Jonah. Um, so verse 14. Um, so verse 14 is basically them praying. So it says, we pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life and do not charge us with innocent blood for you, O Lord, have done it as it pleased you. So these men prayed to God as they understood that Jonah was of great importance to him. And they felt that they were doing something against God by throwing Jonah overboard. Um, <clears throat> so we, we see that they, they tried their hardest to find a way to get Jonah off the boat without throwing him overboard. Again, doing anything to a prophet back in that time you incurred the wrath of god like god was doing some crazy things back then right but um in this case even when they tried 
to be compassionate and have a heart. God was not allowing it. So now they're praying to God, trying to get him to, um, what is the word? Trying to make sure he doesn't get upset, in a sense, with them for throwing a prophet overboard. Um, and the cross reference I have for this is Deuteronomy 21 and 8. And that one says, Provide atonement, O Lord, for your people Israel, whom you have redeemed, and do not lay innocent blood to the charge of your people Israel. And atonement shall be provided on their behalf for the blood. So, if this was not a situation in which God wanted Jonah to be thrown overboard, just, let's just pretend that God had nothing to do with this, okay? And there was a storm, and these... Marina has decided to just throw him overboard. God would have been upset. There would have been wrath. And um, God would have killed, most likely, these marinas for throwing one of his chosen people overboard. So they're praying to him, asking him not to do that. Because they may not be of the chosen people. They may not know God the way Jonah does. But they know of God. Like people during this time. They knew who God was. They knew the one true God. They knew his power. They knew how much um, he loved his people. They knew that they, they couldn't mess with the chosen people. And if they did. They had some things to deal with. Right? So they were in essence. Um, I don't want to say seeking audience. What is the word? Oh my gosh. I can't think of the word right now. But they were. Um trying to tame tame is that the right word trying to tame i guess um god from being upset i hope you guys get what i'm trying to say i can't think of it like right now off the top of my head but um yeah so verse 15 it says they picked up jonah and threw him into the sea so god will find a way to remove you from places you don't belong be it voluntarily or involuntarily now back in verses four through nine jonah could have automatically said okay stop i'm gonna get off the boat he could have said i'm gonna pray to god i'm gonna figure this out because i know that this is happening because of me no he decides to just stay on the boat fall asleep let the boat almost get broken up put these people lives in danger so now because you didn't voluntarily you had like you had time to voluntarily remove yourself from a place that you didn't belong so now because you didn't do that god will now involuntarily remove you and from a place that you don't belong and it won't be an uncomfortable kind of position you are now being picked up by men and thrown into the scene i'm pretty sure that water cold i'm pretty sure the waves were harsh like keep in mind god it says that um back in verse four that the lord sent out a great wind on the sea okay and there was a mighty tempest and tempest we understand to be where's the paper i can't find my paper um my paper is gone, but um, Tempest, as we understand, is a hurricane, a stormy, um, hurricane, stormy, or whirlwind. So, this is not your typical kind of, you know, calm sea day. This is a harsh storm. So, you're being picked up by men and thrown, and you're a prophet of the Lord. And, um, you know, you, you just gotta, you gotta do what you gotta do. Okay, do it voluntarily instead of involuntarily. Because if you do it involuntarily, God will get you in the worst way possible. Okay, it won't be comfortable. Um, but then it says, um, and the sea ceased from its raging. So Jonah's resistance to God was the real problem and cause of the storm. Having been tossed overboard and no longer on the boat opposite to where God instructed him to go, the storm ceased. Um, so... When you're no longer in a place that God doesn't want you or when you're no longer resisting him, you now cause the storms and the situations and the trials and the troubles that God put in your life to get your attention to stop. And it doesn't take that long for him to stop them. Um, really, all he wants you to do is stop resisting him so that he can stop the storms in your life so that you can do what he has called you to do. But when you choose to disobey... Um, he will get your attention. Okay. And God, I know for me personally, he has done that plenty of times in like weird ways that I was not happy about. But, um, you know, the, it's, it's just a matter of you understanding that you need to stop resisting him. When you stop resisting him, the storms that he put in your life will cease. But if you continue to resist him, he will continue to build that storm until it's like a hurricane or something like that. Like, you just need to, um be mindful 
So, verse 16. The men fear the Lord exceedingly. So now, having seen the work of the Lord, these men now know how serious and real the true God is. Um, they probably didn't know God personally. They probably, like, never had a personal encounter with God. But um, now, after seeing that God stirred up the winds, he caused this big hurricane in the middle of the sea. He wouldn't allow them to drop Jonah off on land. But now that they had to throw him overboard, they now see that this is not the God to mess with. They understand and had a personal encounter. And um, a lot of unbelievers can have personal encounters with God. You don't have to be a believer to have a personal encounter. As believers, we get to have more personal encounters with God because we get to be more intimate with him. We get to communicate with him more often. But unbelievers do still have that opportunity to encounter him. Um, not much like we do, but they still have that opportunity. So, um... The men feared the Lord God exceed. I'm saying Lord God. The men feared the Lord exceeding exceedingly. They had a personal encounter. Then it says took vows. So um, they took vows after they were delivered. Um, and then Spurgeon preached a sermon with four wonderful points based on the actions of the crew in this chapter, which is in chapter one. So um, they didn't take vows way beforehand. They took vows after witnessing the power of God, right? So it says that sinners, when, were, when they were tossed upon the sea of conviction, they make desperate efforts to save themselves, okay? The second point is that fleshly efforts of awakened sinners must inevitably fail. The third point is that the soul's sorrow will continue to increase if it relies on its own effort. So when you rely on yourself, that you're just making things worse. And then the fourth is that the safety of sinners, I'm sorry, the safety for sinners is to be found in the sacrifice of another on their behalf. In this case, Jonah sacrificed himself to save them okay and in doing so it um it sparked something in these men to now take vows because they had a personal encounter though this um situation had nothing to do with them and they were involved in it unwillingly because of jonah's disobedience they now had an opportunity to encounter god and now change their lives they took vows um Thank you, Kimberly. <laughs> and now for verse 17, which is the last one. It says, um, can you see this? Okay. The Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. So God knew that, um, sorry, God knew what Jonah would do beforehand. He knew that Jonah would disobey and still found ways to get him to understand so God already knows when he tells us to do something that we might not obey him, we might um, hesitate, we might resist. Um, and in him knowing that he already has certain things placed um, to get us to understand and to get us to be realigned back with him. So if he tells me to do something today um, and I resist him, he already knows I'm going to resist him. So he already set up things for the future that will get my attention to understand my wrongs and to get back in alignment with him. So the fish was God's means of um, deliverance for Jonah from death. Okay. He prepares... Our gracious deliverance to get us to understand. And it may not be in the way that we want to be delivered. Like, he saved Jonah from dying, but it wasn't the way jo Jonah probably would have wanted a boat, a ship, or something. No. He saved him with a fish. Like, 
God will save you, but he will also reprimand you at the same time. So um, it's better to do things voluntarily than involuntarily. I mean, because think about it. If Jonah would have um, repented before things got as bad as it was, God probably would have been like, all right, you could take him to land. Y'all could, you know, find him another boat. Instead of him doing that now, he has to stay inside of a fish for three days and three nights. Okay. So then it says Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So though Jonah was a rebellious, resistant believer, God was not finished with him yet. The Lord preserved his life and worked on his heart. Um, God preserved preserved him and worked on his heart. Okay, so um, God has a way of bringing us to a place where he wants us. Um, and Jonah's deliverance came after three days and three nights had passed. So providing a foreshadowing of Jesus's resurrection. Um, so yeah, Jonah's disobedience or um, his deliberate disobedience is chapter one. And personally, I got a lot of out of studying Jonah because um, you could definitely see a bit of foreshadowing what in the world oh I know I forgot an arrow somewhere um there's a lot of foreshadowing to Jesus and I noticed that when I read the, the um the Old Testament a lot now I'm starting to see a lot of similarities between um, the Old Testament in relation to Jesus so yeah Jonah was a hot mess and pretty much that's how a lot of us are we're a hot mess but God continued to um, get his attention God continued to work on him God did not leave him to his own devices um, and we know that Jonah loved God but he was just very prideful and that's pretty much how it can be at times we know what we ought to be doing but our pride can get in the way and um, you never want to be like Jonah. Don't disobey him willingly. Um, just don't do it because you're just going to cause yourself trouble. And not just yourself, but you're also going to put other people in harm's way. So be mindful of um, how you're adhering to God. Be mindful of the people you are around because they could be disobeying God. And you never want to be around people like that because that causes you trouble. Um... And then also ask yourself um, if your actions and the way you carry yourself show that you, you fear God. And fear God meaning um, reverence Him. Because if the way that you are carrying yourself doesn't show that, then that's when people start calling you a, a fake Christian, as you know some, most people like to say. But um, this is it. Jonah chapter 1. I thank you guys for bearing with me. I don't know what was going on with my throat. And I'm getting back into the gist of doing these Bible studies. You know, when I don't do these Bible studies for a minute, um, I have to, you know, get myself back into doing them. So, yeah, um, I hope you guys got a lot out of Jonah Chapter 1. Um, I I love Jonah. Honestly, it might be four short books, but it's kind of like how I feel with Ruth. Ruth is a very short book, but I get so much out of it. And, um... This was my first time studying the book of Jonah. I've always wanted to study it, but I just never did. And, um, you know, the only thing that I really knew about Jonah was that he was the disobedient prophet. He was the prophet that um, ran away from God. But when you actually take the time to study it, it's just like, wow, there's so much that Jonah does that we can relate to our own lives. But also that um, kind of uh, connects, not connects, but um, foreshadows to the work of Christ. So, yes, it's a lot of similarities. I think I included that in um, the handout. Let me see. Um, I think I did or I didn't. I don't know. Or I was thinking it. <laughs> I think I mentioned it in one of the chapters. I can't remember. But, um, yeah. That is it for Jonah. I'm still missing a page. I don't know where this page is whatever i'll find it later 
But yeah, if you haven't already, um, you can definitely just get the notes on the blog. Um, and yeah, that's it for today. <laughs> so if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, just leave them down below. Um, and I'll answer those. And if you're watching this on YouTube, just leave them in the comment section and I'll obviously answer those. And, um, yeah. You are all welcome. You're welcome, Tanya and Stacy. Um, but that is it. My brother is making music. I gotta hurry up and go to BSF because BSF started at 11 o'clock. It is 11.33 <laughs> and I'm late. So, I need to log on to that class right now. Um... You're welcome, Tanya. Thank you so much. You have a blessed day, too. Um, yeah, I think that's it. So, these videos obviously stay up in the group, and I also upload them onto YouTube, because I'm afraid that something might happen one day with the Facebook group, and all my videos might be deleted. So, I always upload everything to YouTube um, so that you are able to watch it whenever you want. So, I'm going to actually try to have this uploaded by Friday. That is the goal, by Friday. And, um... Yeah, that's pretty much it, so I'll speak with you all later. Bye.